rom-com. The mm. rom-com, typical rom-com ending would be that they end up happily ever after right. together. And, and they, he gets and therapy they, and they're fine. And they don't. They no. end up separated. Yeah. Um, which I actually kind of appreciated the boldness to do that. Well, I think he's very lucky that she didn't... This is how I would have written the end to the movie, right? That they have the baby, um, she goes home and he's getting sleep deprived and he's so buggered, he goes to sleep. She goes into the kitchen and she grabs a frying pan and beats the crap out of his head while he's asleep. (laughs) It's like the um, you're about to preach on (laughs) JL... In the Bible, (laughs) hammering a a tent peg through a dude's head. That's right. Welcome back to another episode of Filthy Hope. If it's your first time here, welcome uh, on this podcast we spend time in the grey spaces where Jesus, life and culture intersect. I'm your host, Pastor Jonty, and I'm joined by my co-host, Rev Ness. Hey, how are you today? I'm good. I've got a bit of yeah, frustration. Yeah, I can see it. Um, What's going on, brother? You, is this time for a <gasps> vent central? You got it. Oh, play the music, Jonty. <laughs> So for first-timers, Vent Central, you might be going, what on earth are they talking about? Where's this music come from? Mm -hmm. Uh, Vent Central is a segment that we sometimes do where one of us gets the opportunity to rant and rave about something that is annoying them, giving them the shits. Um, People that uh, listen to this podcast often will know that I spend lots of time in a movie theatre because I just love going to the movies. Um, It's one of my favourite things to do on on my days off. and one of the things that annoys me more than anything is poor cinema etiquette. Ooh. Other people in the movie theatre behaving how I think is just obnoxious, annoying. Um, so that's one thing. So, for example... So what um, happened? Well, so I've got, I've got a couple of examples, but there's one in particular that I'm going to get to. But one thing that really annoys me is people using their phone in the cinema. Because the light or the dink? It's ding, both, ding. right? Because part of going to the movie theatre as opposed to watching a movie at home is that the lights are off, yep. no distractions, you're in it. Mm-hmm. And um, there's actually, I think it's it's a really rare thing to be fully locked into a movie without distractions. Mm. And when the person three rows in front of you just gets their <laughs> phone out and they've got this big bright light Ooh. shining in your face, um, or that they uh, don't have their phone on silent Mm -hmm. and all of a sudden it just bings constantly through the movie. Or even, this gives me the shits, I've had people just answer the phone (laughs) in a movie theatre. What are you doing? In the middle of the movie? Yeah, yeah, sorry, I'm just in a movie. Oh, Oh, anyway, and then they just have a conversation on the phone. What are you doing? (laughs) No, do you flip your lid? Do you say anything? I have in the past. I've, I've tapped, I've like walked down, tapped them on the shoulder and said, can you take this outside? Is, is this important or can you take this outside? Because, like, you don't do it at You're the so theatre. You're polite. Would you, would you do it at a stand-up comedy show or, no. at, a, or at a theatre? It's just wrong. Well, like, so I don't understand why some people think it's okay to do that in a movie theatre because it's, st- like, it's, a, it's something that we've paid for yeah. to see and it just yeah. ruins the experience. Um, this is a, a slightly conflicted one for me, though, because I had this experience a couple of weeks ago Um where it was a Monday morning, yep. went to see a movie, uh, reason for which we'll get to shortly. Um, Monday morning, 10.30 screening. Um, like who goes to the movie on a Monday morning other than you, mate? Other than me, it's usually uh, groups of retired women. Nice. <laughs> and on this occasion, about six mothers with babies in prams. Oh, you're kidding. Which, uh, you know. So you weren't going to see Alien. No, (laughs) which also (laughs) is excellent. We'll talk about it another time maybe. Um, But there's (laughs) there's two things here. It's the row of five retired women who treat it like a coffee date and just chat. The whole way through. The whole way through. Yeah, loud? Really loud. Yeah. 
Uh, like flow of conscience out loud yeah, to not one e- another. not even about the movie. Okay, yeah. Oh, mm-hmm. did you hear about uh, Margaret did the thing with blah, 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 blah. Oh, yeah, the blah, 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 blah. Shut up. <laughs> <laughs> Go get a coffee. Like what? what? Surely, like, the fact that there's a movie playing loud on a big screen in <laughs> front of you. Did like, you just did an accent? You told me I'm not allowed to do my vet central with an accent. Well, just quietly. That's, <laughs> mine wasn't a racial accent. <laughs> <laughs> but it was still a demographic accent. <laughs> that annoys me. People just chatting in a, in a movie theatre. The thing that I'm conflicted about, and you can tell me whether this is, um, I'm allowed to be annoyed by this or not, was there were like six separate individual prams, all with like young children, like, like babies. babies. Um, none of the babies were particularly loud. That's lucky. So there, there was some, a bit of crying here or there. Um, but uh, t- tell, tell me if I'm crazy. The, the baby three rows behind me, I suddenly smelt... A poo? A poo. <laughs> and that's fine. Like I had my godson sitting on my lap at church the other week and he shat himself. And that's fine. You go, oh, yep. time for a nappy change. Yeah. The mum... <laughs> Then don't change tell me. the nappy. No, not in the movie. Yes. <laughs> and so all of a sudden the smell gets significantly worse. <laughs> and I terrible. turn around and there's a mum changing her baby's it's nappy. so bad, Jonty. In a, in a movie. <laughs> <laughs> well, and I turn around I'm like... What did you say? I didn't say anything because, like, is that... Uh, am I allowed to be annoyed at that? <laughs> But also, like, I'm not a parent, but if I, I, like, hopefully I will be a parent at some point. I wouldn't bring a young, like, that young, I wouldn't bring a kid into a movie. No. Partly because I'd be like, you're going to ruin the movie for me. I'm going to have to leave and change your nappy at some point probably. (laughs) Apparently not. So she just did it right in front of everything. Yeah. And, I mean, to her credit, she was... Towards the back. Yeah. So she wasn't, she wasn't doing it in and front of anyone. And if you think of the demographic, right, you've got all these grandmas, yeah. they're used to changing pooey nappies and you've got another row of mums yeah. that are up to their eyeballs in pooey nappies. So yeah. it was like shit central really, yeah, yeah, yeah. wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And meanwhile I'm and just they're all used to it. 26-year-old sitting in the middle and <laughs> cool. inside this ring of <laughs> snowy-haired <laughs> retired women and mums in pooey nappies. Lululemon. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> See it now. Prams rocking back and forth. Oh, <laughs> mate! Moral to the story: Don't go to the movies at ten thirty on a Monday. Yeah, or don't. Anyway, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yours is probably better. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> there you go. That's my vent stage. People can let me know. Am I crazy for being annoyed by a, a parent changing a shitty nappy in a cinema behind me? I think I would really love to hear what people have to say about that. Yeah, yeah. Because I'm not a parent mm. as well. So, and it's it's kind of yeah. As a I don't mum, know. I don't know. As a mum, yeah, and I've done prams with babies. It's not something I would ever do. I would go into the bathroom and yeah. do that um, because it's more hygienic. I can see what I'm doing. I can well, get all the poop out there. of the parts. It's dark in it's there. It's dark, <laughs> and it's just a bit rude. Would you take a dump in front of a group of people in a movie cinema as an adult, and then wipe your bum? Yeah, but I'm toilet trained. So. <laughs> I just I think it's wrong. <laughs> It's yeah. just wrong. Great Vent Central. So like I said, that trip to the movies was actually related to this podcast that we're about to do. I went and saw, at your recommendation, because you had already seen mm-hmm. it, um, the new film starring Blake Lively, It Ends With Us, mm. based on the novel uh, by Colleen Hoover, which you've got a copy of yeah, here in here front of you. Um, we thought it would be an interesting conversation to have on the podcast for a number of different reasons. Yeah. Um, but I guess... Top down, before we get into some of the content and some of the mm. discussion we want to have about it, mm. the movie itself. Right. What did you think? Well, I 
Actually, before you go, yeah, we need to also let people know that this movie. Uh, bit of a warning. Bit of a warning has some uh, domestic violence themes in it. And yep. so we're going to be talking a little bit about that and the way that the movie does or doesn't depict domestic violence well. And we're going to be getting into some some practical discussion about yeah, that, so we, that whole topic. So yeah. just a heads up, that's where, so that's where this is going. this isn't your vibe, please tune out and catch us next week. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and we understand. And I kind of wished I hadn't gone to the movie. Yeah, right. Okay. Because I, my daughters both desperately wanted to see it. Yep. And they were so excited because they'd both read the book. I'm actually holding Ginger's copy of the book. And I'd heard the girls talking about the book and how great it was and they were really looking forward to seeing the movie depiction of the book. And they said to me, Mum, do you want to come? And at Blake Lively's in this movie. I said, oh, yeah, sure. That sounds like a great mother-daughter bonding thing. And Ginger said to me, oh, there's domestic violence in it, Mum. It's about DV. So you there might be you might get triggered. I'm going, oh, I, I'll be fine. I'll just be fine. That'll be no problem. Ginger says to me again, are you sure, Mum? Are you sure? We can catch up with you after the movie. And I said, no, mate, I, get me a ticket. I'm, I'm in. I, I'm not going to be triggered by that like a little old. What's its rating? And she said, I think it was a M. Yeah. I said, oh, can't be that bad. It's yeah. going to be fine. It's going to be... You know, be sweet. See you there. Oh, kind of wishing I hadn't gone because I was triggered. It ruined my Sunday evening. I had real. I, I didn't. Re, I wasn't. I wasn't upset in the moment. I was. It hit me after, like several hours after, mm-hmm. and I was really anxious. And um, I had. Uh, I had. A real manifestation of upset, big, yeah, um, because of one of the particular scenes where domestic violence happens and he is pinning her down, mm. holding her down, and yeah. I knew that that was that was the moment that I got most upset because yep. it just triggered my own personal memories. Yep. So I'm wishing I hadn't seen the movie, but because of that. If that hadn't happened, it might have been a whole other thing because lots of people are seeing this movie and not having any upset whatsoever about it, you know. not Their Sunday evening doesn't get levelled because they've watched the movie. Mm. I'd be interested to know, did your, son, did your Monday evening get levelled because you watched the movie? Not for the same reason. Yeah, right. I, I didn't love the movie for, for a bunch of different reasons. Yeah. Um, but yeah, look, it, to answer the question in the spirit that it's been asked, like no, no, yeah. no, that yeah. that stuff didn't didn't mm-hmm. bother me. Um, it actually surprised me. I was expecting, knowing very little other than some very brief kind of uh, things that I'd heard about the the book and the movie, um, and who the author is. I was expecting it to be. I, well, put it this way, I was surprised by how nuanced it was in its depiction of domestic violence. Yeah. It was better than I thought it was going to be. Yeah. I was ready for it to be terrible. Yeah, it was. I think um, they handled it really, the imagery, very well. Mm. But I, you just need to be a little bit creative to imagine what, what – when they stop the camera, you know what's happening anyway. Yeah. And so um, – and I think that's whether you've seen or been a part of domestic violence or not, you know what what's partake what's happening mm. without the camera revealing, which I think is very clever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Clever and, and writing. Um, the director and also star he plays. Yeah. Uh, the boyfriend, eventually husband, um, which we'll get into, um, has been very vocal throughout the press tour for this movie about advocating for um, awareness of domestic violence Mm -hmm. and and they worked in partnership with a um, organisation in the production of the movie and and now in in some of the um, press and and, and advertising for the movie in in being very vocal about this is a movie about domestic violence and one that I thought... And I'd be curious to hear what you think about this. The way that it's depicted in... The Blake Lively character doesn't quite realise that she's in a that situation, mm. and the way that the scene is edited and presented to the audience mm. c- 
communicates that. Mm. The first instance of instance of violence at home is presented in a way that you kind of go, "Did that really? Did happen? that really happen? Yeah. Was it an accident?" Yeah. And it's later. It's clever, isn't it? That the movie then recontextualizes it and shows, "No, no, no, that was actually an act of violence." Mm. It goes as far as to contextualize why, like where that violence comes from, mm. without excusing the violence. Yeah which I think is really... Often you see movies like this and it's, oh, but the violence comes from this place so it's justified and mm. they end up together anyway mm. and it's all happily ever after. Yeah. That doesn't happen in this movie. The, the, the reason for the violence is acknowledged mm. and is held accountable. Yeah. And both can be true. And I think I was, I was pleasantly surprised by that. Um, yeah, me watching too. Watching this movie. Yeah. yeah. That was the good take-home piece, yeah. I think. Um, I think it was really interesting how she was left questioning what happened. Mm. So that leaves me thinking she was so knocked out, so semi-unconscious in the moment that she doesn't realise he's swiped her head Yeah. in the first instance, right? And he then says that was just an accident. It was an accident that happened. But even as the... Um, the viewer of the movie, you're left thinking, oh, maybe it was. Exactly. It was clever, yeah. wasn't it? Yeah. Because it leaves you doubting as well. Mm. Because he's so handsome and intelligent, he's a neuroscientist, he's a neurosurgeon, he's really sexy, he's a beautiful looking man set, say, would you say mid 40s? And yeah. she's like in Late her 30s, early, maybe, early yeah. 30s. Yeah. Um, she's pretty, she's Blake Lively. Um, She's got a great bod. They've both got good bods. They're just a lovely looking, beautiful couple. We get the perfectly lit, slow oh, tilt yeah. down, the, <laughs> down the abs. Yeah, he's got good abs and a good rack. Yeah. Yeah, I, absolutely. I find that stuff a bit... Yuck. Yuck. Um, but he does anyway. Yeah. yeah. And, and that's one of the tropes that I think that uh, there's some criticism, certainly more towards the book than the movie, but there's some criticism for this movie as well around the way that it depicts them as a couple yeah. as being the rom-com classic of the really yeah. like just hot stunningly couple. hot couple yeah. that, are, that are both incredibly sexy and just have yeah. this insane I'm, sexual chemistry yeah. off the bat like yeah. just they're just like from the from the from the absolute minute yeah. don't they that's exactly right it's it's bizarre mm. but that could also be very real yeah, you know? and, and I want to also be very clear speaking from my perspective that I'm like I'm not the target audience and I don't speak with authority on this subject either. Yeah, I'm neither just, do I. I kind of come from a perspective of someone that watches movies. Yeah, um, yeah. 100%, 100% and I'm yeah. just speaking from the perspective of somebody that watched the movie yeah. and I was interested in the fact that it had... DV content because I wanted to see how it was depicted and handled and I had recently received an article mm. and maybe we should go to that now. Now's probably a good time. Yeah, yeah. and it was um, Sydney Morning Herald on domestic violence and it was from the 17th of July and it said it showed a map of Sydney and where the locations of... Um, the biggest alcohol fueled domestic violence happens in, a, in Sydney. And I found it quite shocking because Wallara and the Northern Beaches, I live in the Northern Beaches, I work in Wallara, and North Sydney come up as some of the most violent hotspots. And it says drunk men are among the biggest dangers to women in Sydney. Of 230,217 domestic assaults involving female victims in New South Wales over the past decade, one in three of those involved alcohol. In the movie, was he... Did did it involve alcohol? No. no yeah, I don't either. think so. He just lost his shit, didn't he? Yeah, well, and it's... Yeah. In the movie, it's, it's from a place of... Like, like, we hear about his trauma from when he was a child. Yeah. Um... And, yeah, so I, I, 
from memory, there isn't any booze involved in mm. fueling that violence. Mm. Yeah. Mm. It says some of Sydney's most exclusive harbourside enclaves, North Sydney, Mossman, Northern Beaches and Wollara, saw even higher percentages of DV assaults involving booze, according to data complied by the New South Wales Bureau of Crime Statistics and research that had been obtained by the Herald. And as we know, it had been a, uh, it's been a horror year of high-profile um, domestic violent deaths. Mm, yeah. Yeah. Um, Three children had been killed by a father in the Western Suburbs house fire. I think that had happened in July. Um, uh, a Forbes woman had been killed by her ex-husband. Um, it was just just disgusting, disgusting amounts of DV, you know. Mm, mm. They say in Mossman, domestic violence incidences involve 38% of the time involves alcohol. Yeah. That's a lot, you know, just incredible. Mm. One and the New South Wales um, Bureau of Crime Stats say that one in four Australian women are impacted by domestic violence in their lifetime. So not just as young women or married women, it's Mm. in their lifetime this can happen. Yeah, and it's it's something that is shown well in the movie. And I will say the the movie itself Mm. is pretty... Singular in its depiction of physical violence. Yeah, it doesn't really touch on some, some control. other forms of domestic yeah. abuse. Um, but we also see that uh, Black Lively's character came from a home of domestic of violence. domestic violence, yeah, not from right. a romantic partner. But mm. her father mm. um, was violent towards her mother, but also towards her, mm. and also towards very much so in a what I actually thought was the the scene that was toughest to watch was the scene where he uh, is violent towards her boyfriend. Oh, that was awful. Yeah. Um, so Who plays the other love interest in yes, the movie. Yes. Yeah, so that's right. It's, it's not, yeah. Domestic violence isn't always mm. between partners. Mm. It can, it, like, so often, tragically, we see it um, between a parent and a child yeah. as well. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, it, it's not, when, when we think about this and when we think about uh, talking about it and raising awareness, mm. it's not just between partners. No, it's it's violence is, is a thing that can mothers be and children and fathers in and all children. directions. Yeah, 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 that's exactly right. These um, domestic violence stats they say the assault victims, the victims that are assaulted, one in ten are young people, mm-hmm. three in five. Are, are women mm-hmm. and Aboriginal women are eight times more likely to be recorded as a victim. Yeah. Then the offenders, 10% of offenders are young people. Isn't that, I found that really interesting. So that's largely young men. Mm. Then three in four offenders are men. And seven in 10 incidents result in legal action. Which is the flip side of that. Yeah. 30% don't. Yeah, that's right. Is a huge mm. number. Yep. A huge number. Yep. Um, I was just looking up at... Because um, often when we... There, there are really obvious signs of physical violence... Yeah. ...that you can be See. aware of. Yeah. Um, so like in, in the film, mm. one of the things that sets off one of the big confrontations is... Uh, noticing of a bruise under the eye. Yeah. Um, but... And she covers it up, doesn't so she? So often domestic abuse isn't visible. So mm. when we talk about... Um, and we'll, we'll talk about our own our own um, uh, organisation, Wellness HQ, mm. being present in places like Double Bay and Wallara. Yeah. Um, it's not visible. Nope. It's really... Uh, goat flies under the radar. And I've, I have a list here of some common signs of abusive, ha- abusive behaviour from a partner mm-hmm. um, that aren't necessarily those physical signs yep. that you can see, oh, they've got a bruise or they might have a lip or like yeah. indications that yeah. there's been physical violence. Broken um, wrist. What, like yeah, that, yeah, all those different things. Those are really easy to, to notice. Mm-hmm. Here's a bunch of other stuff uh, mm-hmm. that I thought might be useful um, just in painting a picture of awareness in terms of maybe... Good our own 
uh, our own presence in other people's lives mm. and, and keeping an eye out for these sorts of things. And you can reflect back to me any mm. if any of these resonate with you or that you've experienced or that, you know, yeah. anything that comes up for us as we go through these. But uh, someone telling you that you never do anything right. Mm. So that constant like... Mm. Putting down. Putting down. Showing extreme jealousy of your friends or time spent away from them. Yeah. That kind of ownership. Yeah. Uh, preventing or discouraging you from spending time with others, particularly friends, family members or peers, um, insulting, demeaning or shaming you, especially in front of other people, mm. uh, preventing you from making your own decisions, including about uh, working or attending school. Mm. Um, it's interesting in our own um, experience here in Wallara with our communities and some of the things that have come across our radar, um, especially in such a wealthy area. Yep. One of the things that really surprised me was that people that are so, on the surface, so wealthy, mm. um, going through experiences of domestic abuse and how that can actually manifest in someone uh, limiting or restricting their access to their to their funds or their wealth or their food or yeah. those sorts of things. Mm. Um, controlling finances, there you go, in, in the household without discussion, such as mm. taking your money or mm. refusing to provide money for necessary expenses. Mm. Um, and again, just a warning for, mm. for some content here, um, but pressuring you to have sex or perform sexual acts that you're not comfortable with, mm. um, pressuring you to use drugs or alcohol, intimidating you, threat, intimidating you through threatening looks or actions, insulting your parenting or threatening to harm or take away your children or your pets. Mm. And then here we arrive at some of the more outwardly obvious things um, like intimidating you with weapons like guns, knives, bats, etc., mm. um, all the way to destroying your belongings or your home or actually mm. physically harming. Or setting, setting on fire like that dude did. Yeah. 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 Um, so th that kind of paints a picture where in the film it's yeah. a very obvious, clear, this is what domestic abuse looks like, mm. whereas in reality... Mm. There's a whole, and that's that's only scratching mm. the surface of some of it. Um, there's a whole spectrum of stuff that, on one end, is really visible yeah. to stuff that is almost invisible. Yeah, uh, I, I thought it was interesting in the movie how he thrashes her, but then his remorse is immediate. Mm. He go, you know, he goes into stitching. He's a doctor, so he stitches up her head that's been cut open. He um, tries to paint the picture of it being an accident straight away. Um, no, darling, that's not what happened. He starts um, repositioning the narrative yep. to suit him and I love you, I love you and, and just love bombs her mm. then. Mm. So then she thinks, oh, hang on, he loves me so much. Any doubt that she'd had that this was a deliberate act of violence mm. is quelled by the fact that he's love bombing her and telling her how much he loves her and how beautiful she is, etc. That's yeah. just so typical of domestic violence. Yeah, and I think something that actually I, I appreciated about the way that that was depicted is that that's genuine, I think, from him. Mm. It's, not a, it's not a case of after the act of violence he still thinks that he did the right thing but is pretending to, to cover it up. Yeah. He realises that what he did was... Terrible. Terrible and instantly feels horrible about yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. Quite, at, like, genuinely. Yeah. And he's doing his best to repair it. Yeah. That, as opposed to the kind of more insidious way that it's sometimes painted as this, like, big narrative that they're, they're in control the whole time. Yeah. Um, but also that still doesn't, and the movie does a really good job of this, doesn't excuse the violence. No way. That still doesn't excuse the violence, but it paints a more nuanced picture mm. of someone who just snaps mm. and commits an act of violence, mm. but genuinely feels horrible about it and mm. is trying to, still loves their partner and yeah. is trying to cover it up. That's far more complex. Yeah. If someone really genuinely does love you and genuinely feels remorse, but still performed an act of violence. Mm. Um, that's far more complicated to deal with than this person's just a piece of shit and, mm. and is violent. That's, uh, that's much more easy to wrap your head around. Yeah. Think, yeah, and we get to see an insight into his jealous behaviour when he's confronted with Blake Lively's um, first love, yeah. the young, the young yeah, yeah. man, and they've bumped into each other in Boston, I think they are, and... Um, 
they have a, a moment of, you know, just... She's so nervous that she can't even have a conversation in front of him mm. in, the, in the restaurant. She has to fake going to the bathroom to bump mm. into him to actually um, have the conversation mm. and then he finds out and then he, lo- he flips his lid, loses mm. shit mm. and wants to beat the crap out of him in the restaurant. Mm. It, that gives you your first... I think it gives her her first conscious insight into what sort of a psychopath he really is. Do you think after she saw him lose his shit in the restaurant and, she, and it reminded her of the violence of the father beating the crap out of the boyfriend when mm. she was 16... I wonder why she went back to him. I wonder what that piece is. And having said that, it's obviously because she loved him. Yeah. You know, that's obviously the answer to the question. Mm. But, at, and, and I suppose at what point do you care more about your personal safety than you care about how much you love him? Or how hot he is. And I'll, I'll throw on to the top of this conversation as well, coming from a church perspective. Mm. Um, there's a long history and legacy of churches coercing couples, particularly women, mm. to stay in abusive marriages mm. for the sake of... Kids. Uh, the kid, But also a theological stance of... Mm. Uh, divorce being a sin yeah. and that um, love and marital love uh, trumps or should should win out over um, the need to leave someone who's violent towards you. So, like, mm. a, a whole spectrum ranging from... Um, and I'm, try- I'm, th- I'm not painting these as better or worse, but um, from whether it's financial abuse through to sexual abuse, Mm. through to physical abuse, through to emotional abuse, Um, women being told by their pastors or by leadership that they shouldn't leave, that they should Mm. forgive Mm. and stay married. Yeah, right. Um, There's a massive legacy of that that Mm. has... ..that then turns into a culture Mm. and a generational trend Mm. of women particularly not always women, but particularly women being told by usually men in leadership Mm. to forgive. And this goes back to our our episode a couple of weeks ago, about a month ago now, um, about forgiveness. Mm. Um, And what this movie, I think, does well is paint a picture of you can forgive. Yeah. But she leaves him. Yeah, that's right. He's still the parent of their child. So that's oh, something we hadn't talked pa- about. Is, it's is a they, powerful thing, isn't it? They have it? a child together um, and they have a conversation. Um, she leads the, the conversation. Yeah, that's right. She, which I think and is she so says powerful. to him, what would you say to, to our your daughter, daughter yeah. if she said that um, she was in an abusive relationship, that someone was hurting her? Mm. Of course you would tell her to leave immediately. Mm. So that's what we have to do. Yeah. Well, that's what I have to do. And she she says Ends they it. want to get a divorce yeah. and they get divorced. Yeah, yeah. Um, and the part of the whole, the, the marketing campaign for the movie was, that in the title of the book and the movie It Ends With Us is mm. We Break the Cycle or the Cycle Breaks Us. Yeah, that's um, right. So that that's, I was pleasantly surprised to see a quite honest and, uh, yeah, frank portrayal of a woman actually recognising, even though I do love this person, mm. I can't stay with them because no. it doesn't toxic. matter. It's, it's toxic. And, and even if, yeah, by, by staying together, mm. even if it may have worked mm. after that, what example are you setting? For your child. For your child. Yeah. Um, so the yeah. powerful imagery that she would have experienced as a child herself. That's right. In her yeah. own growing up, she did not want replicated for yeah. her own Young daughter, yeah. yeah. It from that perspective, it it feels um, very powerful, mm. but also feels very Hollywood. 
<laughs> it's giving a it is. Uh, it's a lovely ending. It's a really nice ending, and I left the movie going, "Oh, that's great." It is, but it's also like because it's it's kind of marketed as a rom com. The mm. rom com typical rom com ending would be that they end up happily ever after right. together, and, and they, he gets and therapy, they, and they're fine, and they don't. They no. end up separated. Yeah, um, which I actually kind of appreciated the boldness to do that. Well, I think he's very lucky that she didn't... This is how I would have written the end to the movie, Mm. right? That they have the baby, um, she goes home and he's getting sleep deprived and he's so buggered, he goes to sleep. She goes into the kitchen and she grabs a frying pan and beats the crap out of his head while he's asleep. Mm. (laughs) It's like the um, you're about to preach on (laughs) JL... (laughs) In the Bible, (laughs) hammering a a tent peg through a dude's head. That's right. I, you know, I I say that in jest, Mm, really. Grandma Henke tells of a story that um, a woman that she worked with in the, at the hospital in Maysville was repeatedly bashed by the husband and the way that she... um, sorted that out was she did exactly that. She took what grandma called was an iron skillet Mm. and thudded him over the head while he was asleep. He never touched her again, grandma said. And I think, wow, that that serves as a lesson. (laughs) Doesn't it? It'll teach you. You know, lucky she didn't kill him. I think, wow. Mm. Yeah. I think like, and this actually is a, we haven't really spoken about the book, but some some criticism that I have read and heard about the book um, is that it kind of uses the domestic violence as a plot to serve a romantic story. Interesting. And it kind of has been perceived as idealising the TV. domestic violence mm. and, and, and using it as a... not as a way of... Raising awareness and depicting it truthfully, but as mm. a simply as a plot point to add drama to a romance. Yeah, interesting. Um, okay. And where the movie actually, I think, does that better, and actually speaks to a deeply Christian stance that I have, um, is like, and, and and if we put our Christian hats on for a sec, when you get married, you make vows to each other. Yeah. And. As soon as that either party mm. break those vows, mm. where the church has gone astray in some places is telling people that you have to stay married. Yeah. yeah. And this is where I think the church has made an idol of mm. marriage. Mm. Um, you do not have to stay in that marriage mm. if your partner is abusive. Yeah. You do not. No. You do not. You have, you have the agency... Mm. To leave that marriage, mm. and that is not on you; that is on the abuser yeah. for breaking that vow. Yeah, and I think that yeah. is a message that hasn't been shared mm. in places where it, when it needed to. Um, I have a couple of friends, um, people in my communities who, in in the aftermath of a divorce, were basically excommunicated from their church community. Yeah. Because the idea of them staying married was more important to that faith community... Oh, yeah. ...than the well-being of either of those two individuals. Oh, yes. Um, and that leads to, in one case, someone that I know years later mm. still has a panic attack at the thought of entering a church building. Mm. Um, so I just wanted to underline that. I don't know who's listening to this, right? Mm. We, we never know who, who no, clicks on these episodes. Right. Yeah. You do not need to stay with that person. No. Despite what your church or any other institution might have told you that mm. now that you're married, yeah. that that's your duty to stay with that person, not if they've broken their vow to you, not if they have abused you. Yeah. If they have abused you, it is no longer mm. on you to make that work. Mm. You have the power now to leave and you have the re- it, it's up to you. Yeah. You do not have to stay. Yeah. You do not have to stay. There there must be a reason why women stay though. Because so many women do and find it so hard to leave. Mm. And I wonder in this area, 
mm. where, yeah, where, yeah. we're coming from today in Double Bay, which has a very high instance of DV, yeah. is it because it's attached to money and wealth and lifestyle? Yeah. And it's there's shame linked with then leaving the the powerful partner who may be the breadwinner mm. bringing in the big cash that's providing the fancy car and the fancy clothes and the lifestyle and the address where you live. Even just the, the financial security. All of that, yeah. yeah. For your children to go to the yep. fancy schools, yes, fancy set of friends. Is it too hard because you're you're breaking away from all of that? It's not just you're divorcing that partner that's abusive, but you're actually in divorcing the partner, the ramifications are for your children as well, yeah. potentially, mm. um, that he would punish the lot of you, mm. children included, which often is the case. Yeah, tragically, that so often is yeah. is the case. Yeah. 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 I want, is now a good time to jump over to, I this think, might be a good time to yeah, hear from, from, from someone else. Let's do um, that. Do you want to introduce them before we jump over? Yeah. We'll, we'll hear from them on the other side of this. but Absolutely. So Julie Ryan is our principal psychologist at Wellness HQ and she is going to help us understand about DV and answer these questions that we've just raised mm. um, about why people stay and the impact of DV on people's lives. Yeah. So um, let's cut over to her now. Great. We'll see you on the other side. Yeah. Oh, we are so excited to have a special guest with us today. Uh, mm -hmm. it, this is beautiful Rena, who is one of the psychologists from Wellness HQ. Plus, Rena runs her own private practice. Rena mm -hmm. comes to us with years, um, decades of experience in mm -hmm. the area of psychology. And we thought it would absolutely be perfect to um, have you on the show to talk about domestic violence as it's such a prevalent part of the conversation mm -hmm. these days and at the moment, yep. particularly with the movie uh, coming out that we've talked about on the show. Uh, mm -hmm. Rena, can, thank you, first of all, for being with us today and having your time yeah. with us. Can thank you, you Ness, and thank you, Ness and Jonti for inviting me as well. Um, it's a pleasure to be part of the show. Uh, it's wonderful to have you. Rena, can you um, help us understand. I know many people often say, why do people stay in those toxic, mm -hmm. uh, abusive mm -hmm. relationships? What what happens for people, Rena? All right. So perhaps we can start off by actually defining domestic violence. So domestic violence is a pattern of behavior in a relationship that is used to gain uh, control or maintain control over an intimate partner. So people stay in this uh, domestic violence situation for complex and interrelated reasons. Um, they could actually be afraid um, for their safety if they leave, and not only their safety, but also their children's safety and even extended family. So because if they leave, there will probably be a possibility of an escalation of abuse. Um, they may also be influenced by uh, the religious cultural background and society's expectations. Um, and it's also worthwhile to actually think about when we talked about domestic violence, as I've defined, there is um, social abuse, um, most probably in a domestic violence situation wherein the abuser isolates the victim from their loved ones or any type of social support that makes the victim feel that there's no one that they can reach out to. And there's also psychological and emotional abuse. And so for example, in the movie, it was very obvious that um, Ryle was uh, engaging with gaslighting yeah. with Lily, um, and it's a psychological manipulation to distort the reality, um, the perception, and the memories and sanity of the victim that they actually probably most likely would doubt um, the reality of the situation and may minimize the situation. Yeah, and yeah. there is also uh, what we call, in, in terms of emotional abuse, a phenomenon or um, an experience that's called uh, trauma bonding. Mm -hmm. So, in in an abusive situation such as domestic violence, there is 
uh, the alternate uh, behavior of kindness to cruelty. Mm -hmm. And so it is um, fostering an emotional attachment to the abuser mm -hmm. because that behavior of, you know, being loving and fostering um, safety and that this relationship is needed and then the abuse happens and then that is reinforced by prof professing love yeah. and affection and so the victim would probably be very confused and overwhelmed yeah. and people may think uh okay but isn't it there's abuse there um but that's what brains do when, when people experience trauma there is not just fight flight or freeze response in trauma situations, our brain makes us respond into a fawn response. That means that our brain is primed for survival. Yeah. And for human beings, attachment is survival. Mm -hmm. And so when we come to think of it, uh, how come, you know, women who are actually may not be financially dependent on the partner mm -hmm. or they're actually, let's say, what society would um, see us um, independent, successful women, and they may be uh, uh, wondering what's keeping them in the domestic violence situation is that um, the emotional and psychological manipulation that is involved. Uh, it's also noteworthy to mention that uh, any victim that has uh, been exposed to domestic violence when growing up has um, Attachment insecurity and a poor self-worth makes those um, conditions uh, susceptible um, to, to, to a domestic violence situation to stay. And I hope that, uh, yeah. Yeah, and certain, that was a great answer. Certainly in the movie, we see that with Lily, don't we? She had yes. a uh, pretty toxic childhood. Dad had mm -hmm. abusive tendencies and um, she, it, it's interesting that she, sought she lived with a partner that also had those tendencies mm. but it, the movie depicts that she was pretty quick to turn around and mm. recognize mm. the abusive behavior but some mm. people can live in these abusive relations for years and years can't they and just yes yes of course because uh when someone is emotionally abused uh systematically and for example Coercive control can also happen, yeah. wherein, unlike physical violence, it's so obvious. Um, coercive control is a pattern of behavior that is used to um, gain control and strip the person's choice and freedom. And these are usually subtle behaviors that mm -hmm. are pervasive. So this could actually take years. This is not one off that it happens. Mm -hmm. And so with that, um, and the threat, intimidation, the belittling, humiliation, people can actually experience a learned helplessness yeah. wherein they feel that they have nowhere to go, that they deserve the abuse. And sometimes the psychological manipulation make them think that they actually caused the abuse mm -hmm. and they deserve that abuse. Wow. And so it takes some time to actually... Um, realize the level of abuse they're experiencing, recognizing that. Mm. And for some, um, it takes a while, actually. And some, it may not really be obvious. Yes. Um, and when you come to think of, you know, um, the statistics that one out of uh, four Australian women are experiencing domestic violence situation and 2,000 reports, yeah. incident reports every month in New yeah. South Wales alone, yeah. And we haven't really, we don't really know the, the gravity of the situation because these are incident reports. And how about those people who don't report? Yeah, exactly. Mm. Yeah, that's right. It's similar with um, reporting of child sexual mm. abuse. We know, mm. we only know of those issues that are being reported, yeah. but it's deeper and nastier than, mm. than the mm -hmm. um, reporting suggests. Mm. Mm -mm. Yeah. And, yeah, and th this is why it's great to be part of this show because um, information is really, really important. Mm -hmm. um, 
and awareness is really, really important mm -hmm. because sometimes people don't leave the abuse because they lack the resources and victims usually leave the abuse when there is a combination of internal strength and courage and the information, a safety plan, where to go. Yes. And at the same time, there's external practical and emotional support that's available to them. Yeah, and wow. we see this in the movie as well. Yes. Because there were still moments that, you know, when uh, she was pregnant and uh, Ryle was actually um, uh, helping out with the crib, there yeah. was a, a tendency for her to still kind of long for him. Mm -hmm. um, and, and thanks to her friend, Alyssa, the sister of uh, Ryle, and at the same time, her mother and also Atlas, mm. um, that has actually gave her the courage aside from her own internal strength to actually move mm. forward and escape mm. from that um, abusive situation. Yeah, it's amazing. And I suppose in situations where there's coercive control and control over mm. the finances, something yes. that at in Uniting Heart and Soul that we can actually help at mm -mm. Wellness HQ is by providing the free counselling um, mm -mm. down in down in uh, Double Bay. So um, yeah. do you want to tell us a little bit more about how that works, Rena? All right. So Wellness HQ is a fantastic initiative of Uniting Church where we offer um, low cost um, to free counselling so we don't uh, turn people away. And... Um, it's actually um, supervised um, by psychologists and we have um, counseling um, interns who actually support us in our um, mission at Wellness HQ. Mm, it's amazing. And I, if you're listening and you know somebody that is in a situation that they could benefit from counseling, mm -mm. please reach out to us. Our details will be below. I'll put Rena's details down below in the show notes or John T. Will. Yep. And also, mm -hmm. Rena, you as a psychologist, you you work for Uniting Heart and Soul, but you also run your own private practice, don't you? Yes. Do you want yes. To and I hear a bit about that if people want to reach out to you. All right, great. Um, so uh, they can get in touch with me through um D R R I N A D A L U Z at gmail.com or Dr. Rena Deleuze at gmail.com. And um, what, since we're talking about um, domestic violence, it's also quite prevalent in my private practice. Mm. Um, so this is a, a very common, um, unfortunately, a common situation. And I do really agree that it is a national crisis yes. um, that we're experiencing domestic violence in Australia. Mm. The well, level of domestic violence. Yeah, definitely. It's, it's, I, I'm glad that we are able to help in that space and mm. I hope that people can um, tap into us or pass our contact details details on so that people can access that free counselling. So mm. We will put all your details below in the show notes, Rena, and yep. we are mm -mm. really grateful for having you on the show today. Oh, thank you so much again for inviting me. And I hope uh, our listeners and viewers have found our um, conversation very helpful. So if they know anyone, um, please, it's very important that you listen without judgment, believe their story, and validate their feelings, offer emotional and practical support if you can, and provide information. Um, just simple as uh, providing the 1-800-RESPECT number would be helpful enough. And while we're supporting our loved ones, our friends who may be experiencing domestic violence, is that you also take care of yourself and know your limits and also get support for yourself um, to be able to actually be there. Um, for your friend, and while also making sure that you are also looking after your well-being. Yeah, that's really good advice. Yeah. Um, thanks so much for being here. And like like Ness said, we'll have all all the details for all the ways people can get in touch with you and with Wellness HQ and all the different resources will be down below. Yeah. Um, thanks for being with us. Thanks, Rena. Okay. Thank you. Bye. And we're back. That was our. Uh, interview with Insight, Jules. Insightful, um, right? Yeah, I, I think really helpful to hear from an expert yeah. in this area. Um, yeah. Before we wrap this up with a, we might do a quick um, message from a from a listener just to wrap up this conversation. I think 
the main thing I want to leave with people is that this, because so much of the issue around domestic violence and abuse goes unseen, mm. that it's imp- it's actually important to have these conversations with with your friends and family. Yeah. Um, so, like, if if you're if you're worried about someone, mm. that there are, there are there are helpful and unhelpful ways to do it, but don't don't be. I I, I just I I. I worry sometimes, um, and I, I've heard stories where this is the case, where someone had a hunch and didn't say anything or didn't do anything yeah. and then something terrible happens. Yeah. Um, so it, it's just just to to spread awareness of this um, and, and like, like we, we went through that list of, of signals and, and identifiers that mm. abuse might be happening, um, to have the conversation before it needs to happen yeah um before it happens plant the seeds plant the seeds in before it is necessary if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah 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 um and if there is danger immediate danger you would definitely call triple o for yep. an ambulance and police and then also there is the 24-hour hotline which is 1-800-RESPECT yep. and there they have counsellors online that can talk you through yep. um, anything. So I think that's 1-800-RESPECT or triple O. And uh, also there's situations where if you hear your neighbour being verbally abused and hit, just call triple O. Yeah. Just call triple O immediately. Get in on it. Just, you know... Don't do that old, um, oh, I don't want to, you know, that will, it's a personal issue. No, mate, it's not. It, it, you're hearing this happen. Mm. You need to intervene and get some help to that family, mm. you know. There could be children there. Um, you, you need to intervene. Yeah. Yeah, safely. Yeah. Also, if people are, this was a very, not surface level, but this was kind of almost like a preliminary discussion that we just had. Yeah. Um, if people want to go into more detail, there's a, there's a really excellent episode of uh, another great podcast with all due respect with Megan and Michael that I'll mm. link down below if people want to continue uh, the conversation. The, 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 conversation. Mm. Um, the link for that will be down below as well. Um, yeah, because I don't want... I, I, I recognise that this was a, a conversation that was almost like a, a conversation starter more than anything. Yeah. Um, uh, and, of course, we have the Wellness HQ facility. Yeah, re- can, you can, can reach, reach out, out to, to me at revness at unitingheartandsoul.org and I can hook you in for immediate free counselling with one of our um, counsellors. So, yes, please reach out or let anybody know that you know that needs that kind of assistance yeah. that it's done totally confidentially and I can set you up yeah. that way. Excellent. Mm. Thanks for having that conversation with me and it was Yeah, it was yeah. rough one. I, I, yeah, it was a rough movie. Yeah, I, I, I'm glad that we had that conversation I think because mm. that movie um, is a big cultural moment at the moment. Like yes. everyone's sort of talking about it. So I thought it'd be particularly this idea that in churches – uh, sometimes we're, we're told, but like we make an idol of marriage, and if mm. if if marriages are the thing that are keeping us in abusive relationships, mm. it's more important to end that marriage. Yeah, and 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 uh, for the safety of the abused than than to than to keep people in abusive marriages. Yeah, yeah. I, it raised for me great questions with my daughters, adult yeah. daughters, about abusive relationships and. Um, you know, we sort of made promises to each other that they would, if anything untoward went on in their marriages, they would let us know. Yeah. And then I would get um, Rob and his mates around to beat the living crap out of their partners. We would take the matters into our own hands and then call Triple O. Mm. Maybe we shouldn't say that. <laughs> Just call the cops. Yeah. Just call the cops. Um, but, uh, like, I think more than anything, like... Talk to the people close to you about it. Yeah. I think that's that's the best thing that comes out of a movie like this. Yeah. Even if the the novel and less so the movie are potentially a little bit irresponsible in how they depict some of this stuff. Yeah. That it starts the conversation. Yeah, definitely. Talk to people about it. Yeah. If you don't talk about it, 
it just goes unnoticed. My mum and dad never had conversations with me about domestic violence. Mm. You know, I um, I didn't think to know that a partner could do that to you, mm. you know? Yeah. Yeah. <sighs> and again, I don't know who's Such listening. Such a heavy topic. But you, you don't have to stay mm. is, is also something that I want mm. to... Um, to round this episode off with something a little bit lighter. Yeah. We got a message from uh, Will, g'day Will, uh, who says, hello, filthy hope. <laughs> Uh, I won't read the whole message, but essentially he was reading the Gospel of Mark uh, when Jesus is baptised by John the Baptist. Mm. Um, Favourite image, actually. Yeah, as Jesus comes out of the water, the spirit descends upon him like a dove is the way it's it's written in in the Mark account. Um, So in relation to this idea that Jesus being both fully God and fully human, he asks... Is there a possibility that Jesus was just a normal man until this moment that the Spirit came upon him? Is it maybe? Is this maybe why he hadn't performed any miracles up until this point? Is this where the fully God and fully human elements intersect after the first thirty years of Jesus' life uh, was just him as a human? Uh, interesting. I hadn't thought about this before because um, there is definitely truth to the idea that it's really after his baptism. That Jesus' ministry kicks in, and he and he starts the, you know, his his journey to the cross. But he was conceived fully divine. Yes, you know, he was conceived of God. He is God, divine, and so I think he was fully God and fully human. He was both. Mm. And I think the spirit, it, we believe in a triune God and so I believe that he was born of the spirit as well. Mm. And you know that that um, story of Mary pregnant visits Elizabeth, very pregnant with John the Baptist in the tummy, mm. both the cousins are pregnant at the same time, and I think it's... Is it John that jumps for joy in in Elizabeth's tummy when yeah. Jesus yep. in utero turns up? And with Mary, yeah. Yeah, with Mary. That's got to be a whole that's a Holy Spirit thing. Mm. So I think the spirit was already there. So I think it's a marking of um Jesus' ministry, mm. definitely. But I think he was already filled with the spirit because he is God. Yeah, and we read there are some stories about um, Jesus as a, as a child. Yeah, R- um, racing to the temple. Yeah. That, you know, hey, not not Seeking. stuff that your regular kid... No, <laughs> you seeking know. and longing for yeah. conversations with the rabbi. Yeah, basically... About God. Like... About himself. Out, out preaching the rabbis <laughs> as a kid. Um, <laughs> and and saying, saying some... Like... Speaking to his parents mm. in a way that indicates that Jesus at that age is, is still is, is aware of who his he is. divinity. Yeah. You raised a really interesting point though and it's really the flip yeah. to the comment that we yeah. got in the mail that was it a sign of oh, that's right. yeah. Jesus... Maybe acknowledging his humanity. Yeah. So, in just thinking about this question, Will, I was I was thinking possibly the point at which we, we could almost view the baptism of Jesus by John the Baptist as actually even a moment at which the divinity of God present in Jesus submits to the fully human in mm. choosing to be baptized by another human. Mm. Um, there's probably heaps and heaps of stuff you could tease out of that. But I don't know. There was something about this idea of Jesus deciding, like Annie, he, he insists when John the Baptist yes, is like, no, who, like, I, I can't you do can't this. make me do this. Yeah. Like, you're, you're Jesus. I know who you are. And he yeah. says, no, 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 I need I'm you. I'm not worthy of having tying but, your... St- Having sandals. That's right. Like yours. Yeah. What's the expression? I can't remember. Yeah. Um, but it, something about shoelaces. And he insists. And he <laughs> yes. says, no, 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 you have to baptize me. And I, I'm, I'm actually 
thinking and wondering whether this is a moment in which the divine is lowering God's mm. self to the level of humanity mm. to be baptised by the hands of another human. Um, I don't know. There might be something in there. Oh, it's just a, it's a head expander. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it, it gets to, like you say in the question, the paradox. Yeah. That it's a great Jesus one, was Will. fully God and fully human. Yeah. Thank you, Will. That was a top um, question. Yeah. Love it. Thanks for the question. It was uh, mm. it, that's that's prompted some more questions. That, yes. I think that's the best type of question of the ones that lead to more questions. Hundred um, percent. So, if you want to ask us a question, if you want to continue the conversation, whether it's about that or mm. uh, particularly about the conversation we had this episode about the film and the and the book and and the topic of uh, domestic violence and yeah. awareness, um, get in touch. Uh, filthyhopepod at gmail.com or you can join the Facebook group down below. There's a link to that uh, where we interact with our listeners in a much more... 1-800-RESPECT. Yep, 1-800-RESPECT. Um, there's a bunch of... I'll have some more resources for... Um, DV. DV down below. Um, Great. Don't hesitate to use them. And uh, our details if you want to make an appointment for Wellness HQ in Double Bay. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think that does us for now. It was big. It was big. Uh, thanks for sticking with me through yeah, that yeah yeah um and thanks for being willing to to listen to to that conversation um mm. I, ho- I hope my hope and my prayer is that it's helpful hope we did some justice to that just yeah. in raising awareness that's it raising neither awareness of us are experts starting the conversation yeah that's the one yeah. um we will uh see some of you tomorrow for into the word um if not we'll see you right back here next tuesday uh for more filthy hope yeah Thanks for chatting. Yeah, thank you. And we'll see you guys next week. Have a good one. This is a prayer for the people who want to give up. Who have been hurt beyond repair and cannot bear to see your face in anything. Find peace in letting go of the guilt that is in yours. And find hope in understanding. Life is not a game you have to win. Forgiveness overwhelming Salvation not deserving You are loved by something beyond Someone beyond understanding